Today, you're going to watch the second part of my conversation with distinguished professor, scholar, and historian from Oxford, Oxford University, uh, Sader Hazari Sen. He's written a very compelling uh, book, a biography on the life of Toussaint Louverture. Um, last time you watched part one, this is part two and the last portion of our conversation. But before we get into the video, I just want to remind you that it's important to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you do, don't forget to click the notification bell so that way every time a video is posted, it'll go directly into your portal. So let's get started. You know, we're going to talk about the other aspect to Saint Louverture. Yeah. So, we were talking about his military victories, his prowess, his intellect, his genius. Now we're going to talk about so many things that intellectual scholars say of Toussaint about Toussaint, and you devoted a big part of the book also talking about it, uh, writing about it. You say uh, what Douglas say of Toussaint in particular in Chicago. So uh, why do you think so many intellectuals, uh, some sort of our worship Toussaint, whereas when it comes to Dessalines, very little they want to say about him. That's a fascinating question. and. Um... And I think part of it is to do with um, the, the very human qualities that he, um, that he showed throughout his leadership. He was a man who was um, uh, compassionate, um, caring, um, a devout Christian, of course, um, and someone who believed in, in, in brotherhood, uh, not just which was a kind of Republican, French Republican principle, but something that also came from his own spirituality and from, and from the Vodou tradition. So it was something very genuine um, in terms of his beliefs. And I think when, when you look at particularly the way that uh, people um, talk about him in America, in America, um, he's someone who is able to appeal to a lot of different types of um, uh, uh, African-American um, intellectuals. The ones who are slightly more on the religious side will see him as a man of God and, and as a man who preached forgiveness. And there's a whole tradition of writing about him that comes from that perspective. But on the other hand, if you, if you believe in in resistance, if you believe in, you know, an eye for an eye, if you believe that, you know, you mustn't let your guard down, then there's a lot in Toussaint's life that also um, uh, 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 appeals to that way of, of thinking as well. So I think part of the reason why he is so appealing is that he can, um, he can draw from different traditions and, and even people who might not necessarily agree with each other will find common ground in, in someone like Toussaint Louverture. I have a friend of mine, he's a retired uh, general of the US Navy. And he's read one of the biographies on Toussaint. And one of the conversations that we had, he said, he was so amazed by Toussaint. He believed that Toussaint understood, or at least had mastered what we call the four elements necessary for nation building. And he said it was political, economic, defense, and diplomacy. Do you think Toussaint had really mastered these four elements? Well, I certainly think that he had done everything in his power to build Saint-Domingue up um, into uh, an autonomous um, political community. And yes, you know, I think when you look at his leadership, what he's trying to do is build a strong military. He's trying to build a strong economy and, and he succeeds in doing that. You know, by the late 1790s, all the 
uh, all the infrastructure that had been destroyed, all the productive capacity of Saint-Domingue, which had been destroyed in the first half of the 1790s, he starts to put it all together again. And, you know, production of sugar, cotton, coffee starts to uh, increase again in 1800 and 1801. And um, the other extraordinary thing about him, and, and I devote a chapter to it in the book, is his diplom di diplomatic skills. And, and that's what's so extraordinary, because, of course, you know, he had no training in, in diplomacy. He wasn't like all those uh, people who had devoted their lives to it. But as soon as he uh, sets foot in this world, it's a world that perfectly suits him because it's a world where you have to box clever. It's a world where you have to sometimes say things that are not completely true, let's put it that way. Um, you have to say things that your interlocutors will want to hear. Okay. So he, he promises the British um, far more than he's going to deliver. Mm -hmm. He promises the Americans that he's going to become independent from the French. And at the same time, he's telling the French, I will be completely loyal to you. So, you know, he's, he's playing a very cunning game. And, and, and some, some, some of his critics, both at the time and later, said that he was being... Um, you know, deceptive or, or whatever the word is. I don't think that's right. He was, he was following the interests of his country and dealing with, you know, the imperialists in, in the way that they were used to dealing with everybody else. Because, you know, they lied all the time. You yeah. know? <laughs> the, the, the Americans and the British and the, and the French just spent all their time. And the Spaniards, they lied to each other all the time. So in order to play this game properly, you had to be a bit deceptive. And, and I think to, to says, the measure of Toussaint's diplomatic skills is that he's able by 1800 to make Saint-Domingue respected okay. by everyone, respected by the Spaniards, respected by the British, respected by the Americans. You know, one of the things I didn't know until I did the research was that um, in order to defeat the rebellion of General Rigaud in the mm -hmm. South, mm -hmm. Toussaint enlists the military support of the United States. You know, the Americans, really? the Americans help him defeat Rigaud. They provide him with weapons and um, naval power. And but it, let, let me stop you here for a second, because in the book also you mentioned Thomas Jefferson, you know, view of Toussaint, and he also dubbed them Toussaint and his revolutionary comrades, to quote it, as being cannibals of the terrible republic. But yet, they provided support for Toussaint to defeat Rigo. It's because that at that time, the American um, strategy in the Americas was to some sort of stall French uh, domination or something, because Rigo was very French. Uh, one of the biggest differences between him and Toussaint, what they both agree on the abolition of slavery, but to Rigaud was more like French than, than uh, Toussaint was, was trying to. Rigaud was more French than the French. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but did you say it? Okay. No, I think I think that's right. And um, but I think the big difference in America is the difference between um, John Adams, who's president until um, the late 1790s, and Jefferson, who takes over afterwards. And, and all the help that Toussaint gets, he gets while John Adams is president, because John Adams is someone who, um, you know, he for example, if you compare John Adams to, to Jefferson, John Adams doesn't have any slaves himself. Mm -hmm. He's someone who doesn't uh, approve of slavery. I mean, he's not, he's not an abolitionist, um, but he's not someone who is invested in slavery in the way that Jefferson is. Jefferson is, is, is a slaver, you know, he, he owns hundreds of slaves. And, and therefore when he sees Saint-Domingue and he sees, uh, the emancipation of slave slavery. Terrified. <laughs> he, he's terrified, like all these planters everywhere. So, I think that's that's the difference. But but that that's also the measure I think of Toussaint's skill is that he's able to reach out to the people that he knows might be willing to help him, 
and and they're willing to help him because for for strategic reasons you know john adams uh, wants to help him against Rigaud because he, John Adams believes that if Rigaud wins, that um, f- French positions in Saint-Domingue will be strengthened, and, mm-hmm. and he doesn't want that. But that w- that's good diplomacy. You know, you don't have to love um, your the, p- the person that you're collaborating with. Mm-hmm. What you have to do is be able to identify common interests. And America under John Adams and, and Toussaint Louverture, uh, while he was running Haiti, uh, Saint Domingue had had this had these common interests, and, and Toussaint was able to to. Uh, uh, but to, do you think that Toussaint clearly understood that that was the, one of the reasons why he was receiving support from the Americans? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, he was um, he was playing a very um, cunning um, diplomatic <laughs> game, and. Um, and that's what he wanted to do in order to, in a sense, preserve his position. What he was trying to get to get at was a position whereby Saint Domingue would be, you know, still be still be a French colony, but would be able to deal independently with um, regional powers like the Spaniards, like the um, like the British and and the Americans. So I think he he had a very clear. Um, diplomatic strategy, uh, many aspects of which, by the way, I think Dessalines picks up um, after 1804. The, there's a lot of continuity um, mm. in the in the diplomatic strategies um, between Toussaint and Dessalines. Mm-hmm. Now, the other question I have for you is, when Toussaint was captured and the French, did the French truly believe somehow uh, they could defeat the independence uh, drive of saint No, I think by, by 1802, um, um, when they've, you know, from their perspective, they've, they've, they've arranged a ceasefire and um, the the generals and the officers and the soldiers who were fighting with Toussaint have been reintegrated into the French army. Right. They think they're they're in a position to um, to prevail. And and let's not forget that what the French wanted to do in in Saint Domingue mm-hmm. was to follow a very um, a very uh, a, a nasty secret plan which mm-hmm. Napoleon had. Um, given to uh, General Leclerc, the, the commander of the invasion, which was initially to make friends with um, the black officials and, uh, and soldiers, uh-huh. but after a while to capture them all and send them, uh, send them into exile. Uh-huh. So um, uh, the French had a, had a long, long-term plan, which was to eliminate basically the black leadership and, and restore white supremacy. In Saint Domingue, was that was that really part of the uh, the plan? How General Jacques Mokpa was assassinated? Uh, yes, well, well, um, eventually people like Mokpa um, were were to be eliminated, and um, uh, and everyone, you know, including Dessalines, eventually, had he stayed with the French. Uh-huh. Um, uh, would have been um, would have been killed, and and of course, once once uh, once Toussaint's lieutenants realized this, um, that's when it was strategically important for a union between blacks and mulattoes. Exactly, but but I should say that um, that was the strategy that, as as you yourself uh, reminded us um, earlier on, the strategy of uniting um, everyone. Was a strategy that Toussaint had been following from 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 the get go. You know, when you look at his army, what is very striking about it is that it's an army that, at all levels, you know, whether it's the rank and file, the the officials, or the high command, you have white people, um, black people, and mixed race people. And um, so, uh, right until the very end, you know, Toussaint is surrounded by. Um, by this kind of rainbow coalition, as it were. 
So ultimately, in the wake of uh, uh, Haitian independence in 1804, uh, the colonial powers, actually, they were terrified. So there come the strategy to some sort of a keep Haiti in the box to make sure that the Haitian story would never be repeated again, but it would never be a successful story. So how, as a historian, a scholar, how do you see the context in which Haitian independence was conceived in 1804 and the struggle for racial equality that we're still facing in the United States more than 150 years later? Well, it's, it's only the beginning of a very long story, which, as you rightly say, Arden, is, is continuing to this day. And it's a story where um, the struggle for Black rights um, and Black dignity um, mm. is one which is fought by, um, by the revolutionaries in Saint-Domingue. And um, it's picked up by um, everyone in, um, uh, in the United States who fights against um, slavery in the first instance. But then um, the struggle for um, uh, civil rights in America continues to this day. And, and all that generation, you know, those two or three generations in the 20th century who fought for um, African-American civil rights were all people who were intimately intimately connected with the history of Haiti. I mean, that was the other thing that I discovered when I was writing this book, that people didn't have to read books to know about Haiti in America. Yeah. In the 19th and 20th century, uh -huh. if you were an African American, uh -huh. you just knew the story, right? It was told to you by your, by your mother, by your father, by your grandparents. It was part of the, the kind of oral, oral tradition well, one other thing I actually, the uh, uh, Professor Thomas uh, Art, I spoke to last week, uh, the refugees in, 18, in, in 1791, refugees arriving from saint Domingue after what they call the Night of Fire, which is, uh, yeah. so there were two groups of them, the French and racist uh, uh, officials in the city of Charleston welcomed them with open arms, but what they call the French Negroes, they hit them with a passion, understandably and arguably. But, but on your research, is there a way that we can still trace those French Negroes who arrive in Charleston and Louisiana and Baltimore? I didn't even know if they all the way up to Baltimore because the ship from Saint Domingue arrived in that port there. So, is there a way that we can trace this, this, uh, those Negro refugees? Yes. Well, it's it's a story that um, American historians are now starting to uh, study. Really? And there are some there are some really good books that uh, that are starting to be written um, about that. Uh, I didn't. I didn't follow that story in in great detail um, in my book, but it's very clear that from the early 1790s, um, all the way through to uh, Haitian independence, and then indeed in the, in in the 19th century, you have very close connections between black people, both in the United States and and in Haiti. At first in Saint Domingue, and then in Haiti. Because, for example. Uh, one thing we we should remember also is that a lot of the ships that were regularly traveling from America yeah. to uh, to Saint Domingue and or to Haiti and coming back, the sailors were were very often black people, um, and so they were they were bringing back stories about what was happening. So that, so the sailors were very often were black the sailors. Yes, um, uh, many, many were. And, and indeed, one of the things that we now know is that the, the, tr the, the traffic went both ways. In the 1820s and in the 1850s, tens of thousands of African Americans left America in order to go and settle in Haiti, right? So you had communities in, in both places. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also know that, uh, you know, there weren't very many big attempts to overthrow the institution of slavery in America, but, you know, Nat Turner tried, um, uh, uh, Denmark Vesey tried, and, and 
you know, uh, historians are still uh, arguing about the extent to which they were influenced by, by Haiti, but th there is clear evidence from the whole region, in fact, not just from America, that when slaves were uh, revolting um, against, their, uh, against their condition, um, everywhere in the Caribbean and in South America, they were talking about Haiti and talking about Saint-Domingue. So Saint-Domingue is this huge influence um, on um, uh, 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 the way in which um, men and women of African descent um, fight for their, their rights and for their dignity. Now, uh, many people are saying that Haiti's uh, misery has disintegrated, even exacerbated after US occupation or during the US occupation, 1915, 1934. Because after that, mostly every single Haitian government has to be sanctioned by Washington. So how, what can you say to a young Haitian American, like my son, who's proud to be a Haitian, of course, Haitian American, but it doesn't seem to know the pride, the glory behind Haiti's history. What would you say to, because many of them watch this show. Well, um, it's that um, this is a wonderful story and, and it's a proud story, which um, in fact, not just every Haitian, but every, every, um, every decent human being um, in the world, um, should know about because it's it's a universal story. That's 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 the that's the point also. That um, in order to get to where we are now, you know, we live in a world where some parts of the world enjoy democracy, enjoy um, freedom, enjoy equality. That that these things didn't come automatically. They came because um, people who came before us fought for them mm -hmm. and gave their lives so that um, we could enjoy these freedoms. And that's what Toussaint Louverture and, and his comrades were doing in Saint-Domingue. They weren't just fighting for themselves. And, and, and you see it in, in Toussaint's speeches. He okay. says that what we're doing here is, is for the whole of humankind. Um, and so when we think about ourselves and the relatively privileged positions that we enjoy right. today, right. we should always remember that it's thanks to people like Toussaint and Dessalines mm -hmm. and and the tens of thousands of um, ordinary soldiers, um, mm. men and women who fought um, against uh, slavery and for emancipation, that they are the ones who made it possible for us to enjoy our freedoms today. And that's why we, sh we should remember them and we should celebrate them. And uh, because without them, we would not be where we are today. Now, I have a question every time I have a guest in the conversation. We start talking about the strategic uh, component of it, which is literature, because I know we're human. And I know also I'm Creole, you are Creole too. Yes. But I'm not sure if the Haitian cuisine is just the same as the Mauritian cuisine. <laughs> but I know you've been to Haiti. You have met with, you've been to Haiti, right? When you were doing that research. Right? Yes, yes. So, and I also, will, I see that you mentioned, uh, uh, Yannick uh, Lyons, and yes. also you mentioned uh, Edouard Duval Carré. Absolutely. I know them both, and Duval Carré is a well known paint. You know, he has his shop in Little Haiti in Miami. And last time I was there, that we celebrated the 45th anniversary of the disappearance of Jacques Stephen Alexis, Haitian intellectual who was assassinated by the Duvaliers in 1961. You might have heard of him. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so I was with his daughter and Duval Carré and Gérard Blanco. We all three were there and it was a very important time that I spent with them. But ever since, I don't live down there anymore, so I haven't been able to see him, but it was a great reminder that you, that you, uh, uh, you, you, you mentioned him and, and uh, well, I, I think Duval Carrier is just an extraordinary artist. And uh, one of the illustrations in the book 
is one of his uh, fabulous um, paintings uh, uh, called uh, Toussaint Emanant Jaune, where oh. he, he just has this kind of whiff of um, mysticism oh. around him. Okay. And I, it's my favorite, it's one of my favorite uh, paintings of Toussaint. And, and I have several copies of it uh, scattered all around the house and in, in different rooms. I've made little, little, little copies of it and, and I just love it. And, and I think he's, um, he, just, he just bears witness to how wonderfully creative um, Haitian art has always been. Right, right. Right. And so, so it's really, really fabulous to, to be able to um, say through you how much I appreciate um, his work and his generosity in, in allowing me to, to reproduce that, uh, that image. Um, and also um, another, another thing that surprised me, I didn't know if UF, the University of Florida, had such a uh, uh, swath of, of information on the Haitian Revolution. I don't live far from, from it. I live in St. Augustine and it's a short drive to UF. It goes there periodically. So did you travel to uh, North Florida? Uh, well, I didn't need to um, because actually they've done the very um, decent thing of putting all their documents um, online. And in fact, what these documents are, um, are documents that come from French archives anyway. So uh, um, it's, it's a, the sort of duplicates of, of French material. And what was interesting was that even though I, I, I combed through all the French archives, they, the, in, the, in Florida, they have things that, that are no longer obviously available even in France. So mm -hmm. they've got a really great collection, well, um, which, which is well worth um, checking out. And, and you can do it quite easily because it's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's available online. Uh, one other thing also you say, uh, as an historian, uh, the most, uh, I would say, we view in Haitian historians of the 19th century, uh, Madiou and uh, Saint-Rémy, which you mentioned, and then also we have Ardouin. But yes. Ardouin is a very different figure, very anti toussaint uh, am I right? <laughs> Very anti to say. Yes. And then when I was doing research at the uh, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, I worked hard to find uh, Madieu and the other historians, but I was, it was not difficult for me to find Adouin. Do you think there's a reason for that? Um, well, I think I think all, all of them, all of these great 19th century um, Haitian historians um, have, um, have a basic difficulty with Toussaint. And, and it comes a little bit from, you know, the, the racial politics of Haiti in the 19th century. Um, you know, um, uh, um, Madhu, Madhu is wonderful. I mean, I just love, I just love reading him because he's got such a, He's, he's full of wisdom, he's full of humanity, he has a lovely sense of humor as well. And so you, you just get that wonderful Haitian spirit with him. But all of them, you know, Saimi, uh, Madhu and Ardouin, mm -hmm. are, are mixed race people. Right. And, and, and they come from that tradition where almost, almost kind of despite themselves, mm -hmm. they they were told that Toussaint was a bad man because he massacred um, mixed race people and, and was against mixed race people. So there's a lot of prejudice um, that they have to overcome right. in order to arrive at- uh, Fair in writing objective story. Exactly. Uh, and I think you only really start to get that in the 20th century uh, um, uh, with, with Haitian historians who, who are writing um, in, in the 20th century, then, um, you know, um, the, 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 the picture, the portrayal is, is a bit more objective, but, but, but there's still um, wonderful material, particularly in, in Madhu, because Madhu had this very uh, clever idea uh, of going to talk to um, all the former fighters who 
um, who, who, who were Toussaint soldiers and, and Dessalines soldiers. Many of them were still alive, of course, in the 18, 1840s and 1850s. So um, these, these, these wonderfully vivid battle descriptions that you get in the Duke. <laughs> it's just a, it just says that you, you, you're reading a historical novel, you know, when I like him, he's pretty prolific. And especially, yeah. I was born in the small town in Haiti um, very little was known about this small town participation during the War of Independence, but my my Jew really clarified some things for me. But it, 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 yeah, just like you, I love him. But one last question: Do you, in your research, whatever happens to the descendants of Toussaint in France? Ah, that's a good question, um, and it's one of the ironies um, that actually although Toussaint is, is one of the fathers of Haitian independence, his, his descendants eventually settle in France and, and become French. And, um, and, and as far as I know, all of them um, have ended up staying in France and, and living in France. And so in, in a sense, that's part of what has compounded this, um, this slightly artificial division that you have between the people who support Dessalines, who, who think um, in one way about, about the history of Haitian independence and, and the history of, and the people who support Toussaint. Toussaint, in a sense, was, was often criticized for being too close to the French and, and his descendants, I suppose, provide some evidence for that. Um, but, you know, Toussaint didn't, um, he didn't want to go to France himself. And in fact, you know, I, I have him saying in, in, in one of the letters um, that um, I will never go to France. I don't, I'm not interested in going there. So he had no, um, he had no kind of territorial affinity to France. You know, France, France was only interesting to him to the extent that um, France was prepared to support the revolutionary goals that he was pursuing in Saint Domingue. Um, so, um, but but it is ironic in that sense that um, that his descendants have ended up becoming French. Um, but the other good thing uh, about Toussaint's legacy in France is that since the late twentieth century, there is now a plaque in Toussaint Louverture's honor in the Panthéon, which oh. is the the, the, the sort of um, place where the French celebrate their national heroes. Okay. So this is Toussaint's ultimate uh, victory, Vision. that even the people who persecuted him and killed him, right, because that, that's what happened to him, they now recognize him as one of them uh, and, and one of their national heroes too. So, so after Shoshider, this masterpiece, <laughs> any other any other masterpiece than the work? Uh, not yet. I just want um, to raise it so, so the audience can see, but actually I will, you know, do, uh, they really need to see it. Black Spartacus, the epic life of Toussaint Louverture. You know, I'm so proud of it. My wife is with me now. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank, thank yeah, you. But I know there's a French version. Yes, the French version came out at the same time as the as the English one, really? and the French have been talking about it, um, and uh, uh, it's received some very nice um, publicity. It was shortlisted for two um, uh, book awards in France. Um, one of them amused me because it's called the Prix d'Histoire du Château de Versailles. Really? Mm -hmm. So it, I thought it was very nice that. You know the the house of the absolute monarchs of France wow. <laughs> is associated with um, Toussaint Louverture uh, and his legacy. Uh, I mean, I didn't win, I didn't win either of these awards. But you were sure. But I, the, the, the... But I did win um, in in Britain. There's a prize called the Wolfson Prize, the Wolfson History Prize, which is basically the most prestigious um, history book prize in in the country. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I won it. So Toussaint Louverture is you won the, that one. <laughs> is the winner of the yeah. This is the winner. I was trying to uh, to purchase the French version from Amazon. It wouldn't allow. Uh, 
because it says that the release date is not, I could only pre-order it, but uh, that's what it is. No, uh, it should be available. Um, it, it was published by Flammarion um, and, um, and uh, may, maybe they've, maybe they've run out of uh, copies. Maybe they've sold, they've sold all the copies, but it should be available in print. And you know what? You have something that not very few people really. I guess maybe uh, if you're born and raised and wish to get that gift automatically, uh, you're so well versed. You're francophone and anglophone and creolophone. So <laughs> you got it. And I'm trying to be francophone, but not quite yet because of the fact that I came to the United States when I was uh, about 17. Okay. Uh, yeah, when you do your higher studies in English, so it, it becomes just a quite, you know, I didn't realize how much, how bad my French was until 2004 when I traveled to Paris. Yeah. And since then, I made a commitment to retool my French. <laughs> and I have been reading a lot in French also. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I like that. So you're very well versed in both languages. And that's interesting. And not just speaking it, but also intellectually, you can write and so eloquently, you know, uh, speak it too. So it's a gift. Not everybody has. Thank you very <laughs> so much. With that, it's been such a pleasure to have a historian scholar, Sajer Hazari Sen, in the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, David, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Okay.